Dr. Ford, you tell me when you're ready. You. I'm just organizing my papers. I'll be ready in Take as long as you need. 20 seconds. Thank you. Senator Hirono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, is it your intent to cede all Republican senators' time to your prosecutor rather than they themselves ceding their time to her? Yes. We all know that the prosecutor, even though this clearly is not a criminal proceeding, is asking Dr. Ford all kinds of questions about what happened before and after, but basically not during the attack. The prosecutor should know that sexual assault survivors often do not remember peripheral information such as what happened before or after the traumatic event. And yet, she will persist in asking these questions all to undermine the memory and basically the credibility of Dr. Ford. But we all know Dr. Ford's memory of the assault is very clear. Dr. Ford, the Republicans prosecutor has asked you all kinds of questions about who you called and when, asking details that would be asked in a cross-examination of a witness in a criminal trial. But this is not a criminal proceeding. This is a confirmation proceeding. I think I know what she's trying to get at. So I'll just ask you very plainly, Dr. Ford, is there a political motivation for your coming forward with your account of the assault by Brett Kavanaugh? No, and I'd like to reiterate that, again, I was trying to get the information to you while there was still a list of other... Thank you. ...what looked like equally qualified candidates. And yet they're not here to testify. Dr. Ford, I'd like to join my colleagues who have thanked you for coming forward today. And uh, I and we all admire you for what you're doing. And I understand why you have come forward. You wanted us and the American people to know mm -hmm. what you knew about the character, the character of the man we are considering for a lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court. I want to take a moment also to note the significant personal sacrifices you've made to come forward to share your traumatic experience with us and the American people. You've had to move, you've had death threats, all manner of, of uh, <laughs> Basically, re-victimization uh, experiences have, have come your ways. But by coming forward, you have inserted the question of character into this nomination and hopefully back into American life, and rightly so. We should be made to face the question of who it is we are putting in positions of power and decision-making in this country. We should look the question square in the face. Does character matter? Do our values, our real values about what is right and what is wrong, and about whether we treat our fellow human beings with dignity and respect, do they matter anymore? I believe they do. And I believe the reaction we have seen to this coverage right now and your courage all over this country shows us that we're not alone. You're not alone. That women and men all across America are disgusted and sick and tired of the way basic human decency has been driven from our public life. The president admits on tape to assaulting women. He, sep he separates children from their parents. He takes basic health care protections from those who need them most. He nominates and stands behind a man who stands credibly accused of a horrible act. I again want to thank you for coming forward. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that on six items consisting of various statements, letters, fact sheets, 
uh, posts are inserted into the record? Uh, is that one request or you want me to wait for six? Well, I have six separate items. Okay. They consist, I can go over well, them for you. Okay, no. Uh, I would like to... Let, let me not interrupt you. Okay. Your, your request is accepted without objection. Thank you. And I would like to read from a, an item that has already been entered into the record, but this is from a letter from the National Task Force to End Sexual and Domestic Violence. The letter states, and I quote this letter, this moment has become a crucible. It's a test of our progress. Do we start by believing victims of sexual assault and treating them with dignity or don't we? So far, Senate leaders are failing that test, prejudging the outcome of the hearing, sympathizing with her perpetrator, attacking her credibility. They send a message to every victim of sexual violence that their pain doesn't matter, that they do not deserve justice, and that for them, fair treatment is out of reach. This will only serve to drive victims into the shadows and further embolden abusers. Once again, Dr. Ford, thank you very much. This is a moment for our country. Mahalo. Uh, uh, Senator, uh, Ms. Mitchell for Senator Crapo. Good afternoon. Hi. Um, when we left off, we were still talking about the polygraph and uh, I believe you said it hasn't been paid for yet. Is that correct? Let me put an end to this mystery. Her lawyers have paid for her polygraph. Okay. As is routine. As is routine. <clears throat> Dr. Ford, do you expect the price of that polygraph to be passed on to you? I'm not sure yet. I haven't taken a look at all of the costs involved in this. Uh, we've relocated now twice, so I haven't kept track of all of that paperwork, but I'm sure I have a lot of work to do to catch up on all of that later. I, I get you have a lot going on and you've had that for several months, um, but is it your understanding that someone else is going to assist you with some of these fees, including the cost for your polygraph? I'm aware that there's been several GoFundMe sites that I haven't had a chance to figure out how to manage those because I've never had one. And I'm sorry, done for me. several what? GoFundMe Go Fund Go Fund sites uh, that have raised money primarily for our security detail. So I'm not even quite sure how to collect that money and how to distribute it yet. I haven't been able to focus on that. Okay. Um, In your testimony this morning, um, you stated that Senator Feinstein sent you a letter on August 31st of this year. Is that right? August 31st. Um, let me see. I sent her a letter on July 30th. And I don't have the date. I'd have to pull up my email to find out the date of her email to me saying that it was right before the hearings uh, that she was going to maintain the confidentiality of the, of the letter. Say that again. It was till right before the hearings. That That's what? my memory, but I can look it up for you if you would like the exact date. I could pull it up on my email. Oh, yeah. I just, I want to make sure. Date, counsel. I want to make sure I understood what she, you said. That document's been turned over to, uh, in response to a request for documents, you have it. Thank you, counsel. Um, I wanna make sure I understood what you said. Um, was it your understanding it was going to be kept confidential up until right before the hearing? It was my understanding that it was gonna be kept confidential, period. Period, okay. Um, between your polygraph on August, the 7th and your receipt of the letter from Senator Feinstein, did you or anyone on your behalf speak to any member of Congress or congressional staff about these allegations? I personally did not. So my question was, did you or anybody on your behalf? I don't, what do you mean? Did someone speak for me? Somebody that 
work is working with you or helping you? Did somebody at your behest, on your behalf, speak to somebody in Congress or a staff? I'm not sure. Okay. I'm not, I'm not sure how those exchanges went, but I didn't speak to anyone. Okay. Is it possible that somebody did? I, I think so. It would be possible. I, I'm guessing it would be possible, but I don't know. Okay. Uh, she, excuse me. She, you've asked, asked her not to guess, and now you're asking her what's possible. So I think if you want to ask her what she knows, you should ask her what she knows. Is that an objection, counsel? It I'll is. I'll have the chair rule on that. Understand. Uh, <coughs> Unless there's a legal reason for not answering it uh, on advice of your counsel. So I don't totally understand the question, but I didn't speak with anyone during that time frame other than my counsel. Okay. Um, you've said repeatedly that you did not uh, think that that letter that you wrote on July 30th was going to be released to the public, is that correct? Correct. Okay. And is it true that you did not authorize it to be released at any time? Correct. Okay. Uh, besides your attorneys, did you provide, you provided that letter to Senator Feinstein, is that correct? I provided her a letter on July 30th. We're talking about the July 30th okay. letter. Okay. Did you, and you provided that letter to Senator Feinstein, mm -hmm. correct? Is that a yes? Yes. And you provided the letter to uh, Representative Eshoo to deliver to Senator Feinstein? Yes. Besides those two individuals, Representative Eshoo and Senator Feinstein and your attorneys, did you provide that letter to anyone else? No. Do you know how that letter became public? No. After that letter was pub made public or leaked, did you reach back out to the Washington Post? Sorry. Um, I reached out to the Washington, well, they were continuously reaching out to me and I was not responding, um, but the time that I did respond and agree to do the sit down was once the reporters started showing up at my home and at my workplace. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Ford, um, th thank you for being here. Um, I just want to remind everyone that this is not a courtroom. This is not a legal proceeding. You are here under your own volition. And though that a prosecutor has been engaged uh, here uh, to represent my colleagues, uh, you're here, as you said, out of a, a civic duty. And I, I want to join my colleagues that it, it's really more than that. You know, our founding documents talk about civic duty. Our Declaration of Independence talks about for this country pledging your lives, your fortunes, and your sacred honor. And anybody who's read your testimony knows uh, what you've had to sacrifice uh, by coming forward. Your life has been upended. You have received vicious, hateful threats, death threats. You've had to move out of your family home to some expense, I imagine, to you and your family. You've had to engage security to some expense. You've had to deal with incredible challenges. And what's amazing, and I want to join my colleagues in thanking you for your courage and bravery in coming forward, all to help us deal with one of the most important obligations a senator has, to advise and consent on one of the branches of our government, the highest courts in the land, an individual going before a lifetime appointment. And you even said that the president had a lot of folks on that list, and your fear was that this individual who assaulted you would ascend to that seat. That's correct, right? Correct. Yes, and it is correct that you have given a lot of resources, taken a lot of threats to come forward, correct? Correct. Assault on your dignity and your humanity? Absolutely. How has it affected your children? Um, they're doing fairly well considering. Thank you for asking. And your husband? Doing fairly well considering. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank, we have a very supportive community. That's good to hear. Um, I, I want to use a different word for your courage um, because this is more, as much as this hearing is about a, a Supreme Court justice, the reality is, is by you coming forward, your courage, you are affecting the culture of our country. Um, we have uh, a, a wonderful nation, an incredible culture, but there are dark elements that allow unconscionable levels of, unacceptable levels of sexual assault and harassment that are affecting girls and boys and affecting men and women from uh, big media outlets to corporations to factory floors to servers and restaurants to our intimate spaces and homes and apartments all around this country. I stepped out during the break and was deluged with uh, notes from friends all around the country, social media posts that there are literally hundreds of thousands of people watching your testimony right now. And, and note after note that I got, people in tears, feeling pain and anguish, not just feeling your pain, but feeling their own, who have not come forward. You are opening up to open air hurt and pain that goes on across this country. And for that, the word I would use, it's nothing short of heroic. Because what you're doing for our nation right now, besides giving testimony germane to one of the most sacred obligations of our offices, is you are speaking truth that this country needs to understand. And how we deal with survivors who come forward right now is unacceptable. And the way we deal with this, unfortunately, allows for the continued darkness of this culture to exist. And your brilliance shining light under this, speaking your truth is nothing short of heroic. But to the matter at hand, one of my colleagues who I have a lot of respect for and I do consider him a friend, uh, went to the Senate floor and spoke truth to both sides of the political aisle. Senator Flake said yesterday, this is a lifetime appointment and this is said to be a deliberative body. In the interest of due diligence and fairness, her claims must be fully aired and considered. I agree with him. But you've asked for things that would give a full airing from corroborating witnesses to be called. You've submitted to an intrusive polygraph test. Can you answer for me, how do you feel that all the things that could have been done thoroughly to help this delivery body have not been honored in this so-called investigation? I wish that I could be more helpful and that others could be more helpful and that we could collaborate in a way that would get at more information. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to introduce for the record uh, seven letters uh, by, from Lambda Legal, from Mormon Women for Ethical Government, uh, youth-led organizations around this country, uh, the international unions, bricklayers, allied craft workers, a letter from 295 survivors of sexual violence in support of Dr. Ford, and a letter uh, from 1,600 men, it's a campaign, in support of Dr. Ford, and those who want to assert, men and women, uh, that survivors of sexual violence are not opportunists, do not have political access to grind, but are coming forward with courage and with heart to speak their truth and try to end the scourge of sexual assault and violence in our country. Without objection, so ordered, uh, Senator Tillis, uh, Ms. Mitchell for Senator Tillis. Dr. Ford, in choosing uh, attorneys, did anyone help you with the choice on who to choose? Um, various people uh, referred me to lawyers that they knew in the Washington, D.C. area. So as you know, I grew up in this area, so I asked um, some family members and friends, uh, and they would they referred me to like divorce attorneys that might know somebody that might know somebody, and uh, I ended up interviewing several law firms from the D.C. area. And did anybody besides friends and family refer you to any attorneys? Um, I think that uh, the staff of Diane Feinstein's office suggested the possibility of some attorneys. Okay, including the two that are sitting on either side of you? Not both of them, no. Okay. Um, 
example? We've heard a lot about FBI investigations. Mm -hmm. um, when did you personally first request an FBI investigation? <clears throat> How many weeks ago? I don't know. I guess when we first started talking about the possibility of a hearing, I was hoping that there would be an, a more thorough investigation. Would that investigation have been something that you would have submitted to an interview? I would be happy to cooperate with the FBI, yes. Would you have been happy to submit to an interview on, by staff members from this committee? Absolutely. Okay. Besides, you mentioned some GoFundMe accounts. Besides those, are there any other uh, efforts outside of your own personal finances to pay for your legal fees or any of the costs inc occurred, uh, incurred? It's my understanding that some of my team is working on a pro bono basis, but I don't know the exact details. And uh, there are members of the community in Palo Alto that have the means to contribute to help me with the security detail, et cetera. Have you been provided? I think I can help you with that. Both Kerr Council are doing this pro bono. We are not being paid, and we have no expectation of being paid. Thank you, Council. Have you seen any of the questions that I was going to ask you today? No. Have you, you've been asked a few questions by other people as well. Have you seen any of those questions in advance? No. Have you been told them in advance? No. And, and likewise with my questions, have you been told my questions in advance? Definitely not. Okay. Um, you mentioned about some uh, possible information such as when uh, Mark Judge worked at the supermarket. I, I want to ask you about someone else. Uh, you mentioned that there was a classmate who was really sort of the connection between you and Brett Kavanaugh. Mm -hmm. Who was this person? I, I think that that case with Mr. Whalen, who was looking at my uh, LinkedIn page and then trying to blame the person, I just don't feel like it's right for us to be talking about that. Uh, I'm not trying to blame anybody. I just want to know who the common friend that you and... The person that Mr. Whalen was trying to say looked like Mr. Kavanaugh. Okay. Um, how long did you know this person? Mm, maybe for uh, a couple of months we socialized, but he also was a member of the same country club, and I knew his younger brother as well. Okay. Um, so a couple months before this took place... Yes. Okay. Um, how would you characterize your uh, relationship with him both before and after this took place, this person? Um, he was somebody that uh, we use the phrase, I went out with. I wouldn't say date. I went out with for a few months. Um, that was how we termed it at the time. Um, and after that, we were distant friends and ran into each other periodically at Columbia Country Club. But... I didn't see him often, okay. but I saw he, uh, his brother and him several times. Was this person the only uh, common link between you and Mr. Uh, Judge Kavanaugh? He's the only one that I would be able to name right now uh, that I would like to not name, but you know who I mean. Um, and uh, But there are certainly other members of Columbia Country Club that were common friends, or they were more acquaintances of mine and friends of Mr. Kavanaugh. Okay. Um, can you describe all of the other social interactions that you had with Mr. Kavanaugh? Uh, briefly, yes, I can. There were, uh, during freshman and sophomore year, particularly so my sophomore year, which would have been his junior year of high school, uh, four to five parties that my friends and I attended that were attended also by him. Okay. Did anything happen at these events, to, like we're talking about, besides the time we're talking about? You, you can answer that question, then I'll go to Senator Harris. Go ahead and answer that question. There was no sexual assault at any of those events. Is that what you're asking? Yes. I yes, those were just parties. Or anything inappropriate yeah. is what I'm well, asking. Maybe we can go into more detail when there's more time. I feel time pressure on that question. Okay. Yeah. 
Senator. I'm happy to answer in further detail if you want me to. I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead and finish answering your question. Oh, okay. Um, uh, did you want me to describe those parties? Um, or should we leave this to the next round, Mr. Chairman? Uh, 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 answer the question. I'm just happy to describe them if you wanted me to, and I'm happy to not. It's just whatever you want. Maybe this will whatever is your preference. Cut to the chase. My question is: Was there anything else that was? sexually inappropriate, any inappropriate sexual behavior on the part of Mr. Kavanaugh towards you at any of these other functions? No. Okay. Hey, Senator Harris. Dr. Ford, first of all, just so we can level set, you know you are not on trial. <laughs> you are not on trial. You are sitting here before members of the United States Senate's Judiciary Committee because you had the courage to come forward because as you have said, you believe it was your civic duty. I was struck in your testimony by what you indicated as your intention when you first let anyone associated with these hearings know about it. And what you basically said is you reached out to your representative in the United States Congress, hoping that person would inform the White House before Judge Kavanaugh had been named. That's extremely persuasive about your motivation for coming forward. And so I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your courage and I want to tell you I believe you. I believe you. And I believe many Americans across this country believe you. And what I find striking about your testimony is you remember key searing details of what happened to you. You told your husband and therapist two of the most intimate of your confidants, and you told them years ago about this assault. You have shared your experience with multiple friends years after that and before these hearings ever started. I know having personally prosecuted sexual assault cases and child sexual assault cases, that study after study shows trauma, shame, and the fear of consequences almost always cause survivors to, at the very least, delay reporting if they ever report at all. Police recognize that. Prosecutors recognize that. Medical and mental health professionals recognize that. The notes from your therapy sessions were created long before this nomination and corroborate what you have said today. You have passed a polygraph, polygraph and submitted the results to this committee. Judge Kavanaugh has not. You have called for outside witnesses to testify and for expert witnesses to testify. Judge Kavanaugh has not. But most importantly, you have called for an independent FBI investigation into the facts. Judge Kavanaugh has not. And we owe you that. We owe the American people that. And let's talk about why this is so important. Contrary to what has been said today, the FBI does not reach conclusions. The FBI investigates. It interviews witnesses, gathers facts, and then presents that information to the United States Senate for our consideration and judgment. This committee knows that, in spite of what you have been told. In 1991, during a similar hearing, one of my rep Republican colleagues in this committee stated these claims were taken seriously by having the Federal Bureau of Investigations launch an inquiry to determine their validity. The FBI fulfilled its duty and issued a confidential report. Well, that could have and should have been done here. This morning, it was said that this could have been investigated confidentially back in July. But this also could have been investigated in the last 11 days since you came forward. Yet that has not happened. The FBI could have interviewed Mark Judge, Patrick Smith, Leland, Leland Kaiser, you, and Judge Kavanaugh on these issues. The FBI could have examined various maps that have been presented by the prosecutor who stands in for the United States Senators on this committee. The FBI could have gathered facts about the music or the conversation or any other details about the gathering that occurred that evening. That is standard procedure in a sexual assault case. 
In fact, the manual that is, was signed off by Ms. Mitchell, the manual that is posted on the Maricopa County Attorney's website as a guiding principle and best practices for what should happen with sexual assault cases, highlights the details of what should happen in terms of the need for an objective investigation into any sexual assault case. It says, quote, effective investigation requires cooperation with a multidisciplinary team that includes medical professionals, victim advocates, dedicated forensic interviewers, criminalists, and other law enforcement members. The manual also stresses the importance of obtaining outside witness information. You have bravely come forward. You have bravely come forward. And I want to thank you because you clearly have nothing to gain for what you have done. You have been a true patriot in fighting for the best of who we are as a country. I believe you are doing that because you love this country. And I believe history will show that you are a true profile in courage at this moment in time in the history of our country. And I thank you. Uh, Senator uh, Kennedy now, so proceed, uh, Ms. Mitchell. Dr. Ford, um, we're almost done. Um, just a couple cleanup questions. First of all, which, which of your two lawyers did Senator Feinstein's office recommend? Uh, the Katz. I'm the sorry? Ka um, the Katz firm. Okay. And when you, when you did leave that night, did Leland Kaiser, now Kaiser, ever follow up with you and say, hey, what, what happened to you? Uh, I've had communications with her recently. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm talking about like the next day. Or oh, no. She didn't know about the event. She was downstairs during the event, and I did not share it with her. Okay. Have you been, a, are you aware that the three people at the party besides yourself and, and Brett Kavanaugh have given statements under penalty of felony to the committee? Yes. And are you aware of what those statements say? Yes. Um, are you aware that they say that they have no memory or knowledge of such a party? Yes. Okay. Do you have any particular motives to ascribe to Leland? I guess we could take those one at a time. Um, Leland has uh, significant health challenges, and I'm happy that she's focusing on herself and getting the health treatment that she needs and she let me know that she needed her lawyer to take care of this for her and she texted me right afterward with an apology and good wishes and etc so i'm glad that she's taking care of herself um, i don't expect that pj and leland would remember this evening it was a very unremarkable party it was not one of their more notorious parties um, because nothing remarkable happened to them that evening they were downstairs and Mr. Judge is a different story um, I would expect that he would remember that this happened understood um, Senator Harris just questioned you from the Maricopa County protocol on sexual assault that that's the paper she was holding up um, are you aware that, and you know, I've, I've been really impressed today because you've talked about norepinephrine and cortisol and what we call in the profession um, basically the neurobiological effects of trauma. Have you also um, educated yourself on the best way to get to um, memory and truth in terms of interviewing victims of trauma? For me interviewing victims of trauma? No, to, oh. the best way to do it, the, the best practices for interviewing victims of trauma. No. Okay. Um, would you believe me if I told you that there's no study that says that this setting in five minute increments is the best way to do that? <laughs> <laughs> we'll stipulate for we that. We can stipulate. <laughs> Thank you, counsel. Agreed. Um, did you know that the best way to do it is to have a trained interviewer talk to you one-on-one -on -one in a private setting and to let you do the talking, just let you do a narrative. Did you know that? Did anybody ever advise you from Senator Feinstein's office or from Representative Eshoo's office to go get a forensic interview? No. 
Instead, you were advised to get an attorney and take a polygraph. Is that right? Many people advised me to get an attorney. Um, once I had an attorney, my attorney and I discussed using the polygraph. And instead of submitting to an interview in California, we're having a hearing here today in five minute increments. Is that right? I, I agree that's what was agreed upon by the collegial group here. Okay. Thank you. I have no further questions. Okay. Uh, I have something to submit for the record. We received uh, three statements under penalty of felony from three witnesses identified by Dr. Ford, Mark Judge, Leland Kaiser, and Patrick S Smith. All three uh, denied any knowledge of the incident or gathering described by Dr. Ford. Without objection, I'll enter in the record. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I have uh, something for the record as well. Uh, A number of letters from the witnesses, family, friends, including her husband. Okay. Uh, I'll get to you just as soon as the ranking member. Mr. Chairman, I have uh, three letters addressed to both you and um, the ranking member, and I'd ask that they be entered into the record. Without objection. <clears throat> and it's also my understanding that Mr. Judge is not willing to come forward to answer our questions. Um, as a result, we cannot test his memory or make any assessment of his thoughtfulness or character. Um, and I think that's why the failure to call him to testify is so very critical. And I hope the majority would reconsider that. Okay. Senator Blumenthal. Mr. Chairman, I ask if you have sworn statements that you're submitting for the record that we have those individuals come before us so that we can ask them questions about those statements. I think that the nature of this proceeding would be compromised if we lack an opportunity to ask them questions about sworn statements that will be part of the record. So, uh, frankly, Mr. Chairman, I would object to entering them in the record. Mr. Chairman? Okay. Uh, Senator Whitehouse. Um, I have a number of letters that I would like to ask submitted uh, to the record that relate to um, the importance of proper investigation by trained professionals in pulling uh, these kind of, of uh, investigations together from the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, the National Women's Law Center, the National Organization for Women, and so forth. Without objection, have those letters order, Senator order. Kennedy. Mr. Chairman, I have a question for our chairman. The, the, uh, the statements that uh, Senator Blumenthal talked about, those were statements taken by our majority staff? They're, Is that they're, right? they're already in the record. Yes, sir, but those statements were taken by our majority staff? Yes. Uh, did minority staff participate? No. Why not? Uh, you'll have to ask them. Well, were they instructed not to participate? Yeah. No. They chose yes. not to? That's right. If I may, Mr. Chairman, and I told if I could, I still think I have the floor, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let's listen to Senator Feinstein. Can, can we be excused? Uh, uh, I am the witness is quite staff. tired. I would like, like, I'd to, like to, uh, if you'd wait just a minute, I'd like to thank Dr. Okay. Ford. All right. In fact, uh, we're going to continue this meeting, and we can. Uh, uh, so let's just uh, be nice to her, uh, <laughs> Dr. Ford. <laughs> Dr. Ford, I, I can only speak as one of 21 senators here, but I thank you very much for your testimony. More importantly, for your bravery coming out and trying to answer our questions as best you could remember. Thank you very much. We'll adjourn for 45 minutes. Or not adjourn, recess for 45 minutes.